The fibers in the network that make up the stories of our lives are made of the small moments. A small moment like sharing a family dinner together. It's like looking at, during the summer, a large cloud in the sky at night with lightning firing off consistently in it. Or having a cup of coffee and seeing an orchid bloom in the sunlight of the day next to you. This is what life is made up, but it's also true that in most of our lives, there are single moments, there are singular events that forever change the course of our lives, and after which we are left different than before those. And what I want to do this morning is talk about one such event in the lives of three fishermen from Galilee. This morning, I want to think and speak with you and study with you about the transfiguration of Christ. The word transfiguration means a change in shape, a change in form, or a change in appearance. And what we want to think about is a time in which Jesus changed his form, allowed these three fishermen from Galilee to see a different version of himself, and what that meant then for them. So we want to go back to where it all starts. This event and the series of events begins with Jesus and his disciples only about a year out from his crucifixion. Jesus has been bringing his disciples on a journey to understand his identity, who he truly is. And there came a point where he got away from a lot of the crowds and a lot of the masses of people in Judea and in Galilee. And he went a little bit north of the Sea of Galilee to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And while he was there in this region, Jesus was with his 12 disciples and he asked them a question. He said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Well, some say that you're Elijah, some say that you're the prophet. Well, who do you say that I am? Peter spoke up and he said, we believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus then begins to tell his disciples, based upon who I am, now that you have correctly identified me, I need to tell you, very soon we're going to go up to Jerusalem. And there, I'm going to be rejected by the chief priest and the rulers of the Jews. I'm going to be crucified, but I'm going to be raised on the third day. And after Jesus said this, Peter took Jesus aside privately, and he rebuked him and chewed him out. And he said, far be it from you, Lord, don't talk like that. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And he told them, Whoever wants to come after me and follow me, he needs to take up his cross and also follow me. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And after these sayings, about a week later, in the same region, Jesus then took three of his apostles, Peter, James, and John, and he went up on a very high mountain to pray with them. While Jesus was praying, these three disciples became very drowsy, very tired, and then began to doze off into a sleep. While Jesus was praying, all of a sudden, his entire appearance changed. His face changed and began to shine like the sun on a high noonday. Brilliant, almost blinding. And his clothing was changed. No more the carpenter's robes, but his clothing was white, white as snow, like no launderer on earth could bleach them. And while he was in this changed shape, two other men appeared in glory, in a glorified form, and they also then began to talk with Jesus, Moses and Elijah. And as this was going on, Peter and the others began to wake out of their drowsy slumber, and Peter looks up and he sees a glorified Jesus. And he sees Moses and Elijah in glory talking with him. And Peter doesn't know what to say. And he is afraid. And he simply is able to blurt out, Lord, what a good thing for us to be here. Let's make three shrines for you. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. As Peter was saying this, a cloud began to form and to swallow them up. And as this cloud engulfed them, Peter and James and John heard a voice emanating from the cloud. And the voice said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. 
And Peter and the other two fell on their faces and they were terrified. But then they began to feel a hand on them. And they looked up and it was Jesus. And just Jesus. And he told them, you can get up. Don't be afraid. It's me. As they began to go down the mountain then, they began to ask Jesus saying, now we know in the prophets that before the Messiah comes, Elijah would come. You've been here, but we just saw Elijah. As if to say, well, are you the Messiah then truly? And Jesus said, Elijah did come. And he came baptizing, a baptism of repentance, and the people rejected him. Speaking of John the Baptist, John was the new Elijah that would come and prepare the way before Christ. After Jesus then comes back down with the three disciples, they come and they encounter a crowd gathered around the other nine apostles, and there are the rulers of the Jews there, some there that are criticizing his disciples, and they're arguing. And Jesus comes up, and you know, what, what's the matter? What's going on? Well, there was a boy there, a young man, that was possessed by a demon, and the demon was convulsing him, and he was writhing and screaming. And the disciples weren't able to cast this demon out. And so Jesus rebuked the demon, cast it out. And his apostles later said, why couldn't we do that? What was wrong? And Jesus said, if you have the faith, even like a mustard seed, you could move mountains. And then Jesus began to tell them yet again, I'm going up to Jerusalem. I will be rejected. I will be killed. And I will rise again. So what's the meaning then of the transfiguration? We want to think then about the significance of the transfiguration, what it meant to the lives of the apostles and what it means to us. The first lesson we gain from the transfiguration is that Jesus is indeed the beloved, approved Son of God. As his clothing changed and as his face changed, this was God's way not so much of affirming to him, but to his apostles and then to us who read it, Remember who it was that was incarnate, walking among us on this earth. When Peter and the other two looked up and they saw Jesus in his glorified form, they weren't so much seeing the carpenter from Nazareth, the carpenter's son, but they were seeing the one who crafted and fashioned the worlds and the universe by the breath of his mouth. When they looked up and saw him, they did not see so much the one of flesh and blood, but they saw the Word, Almighty God, the Prince of Peace. They saw the glorified Jesus. And it was a reminder to them and it's a reminder to us that Jesus was the I Am. The change of His face and of His clothing reflected His deity. It reminded them of His true glory that He enjoyed with the Father in heaven, surrounded by innumerable companies of angels, acclaiming him as the thrice holy God. And this is also a reminder of when you would read the prophets in the Old Testament and they would have visions of God or expressions of just a glimpse of the glory of God. He is often pictured as being bright as the sun and his clothing is shining. And what Jesus then is being pictured as by his father, this is the true glory of the sun. Don't forget that. And as the voice from the cloud expressed the fact, this is my beloved son. It's a reminder to us that Jesus was the approved one of God. And if you think about the appearances of clouds throughout the Bible, where do clouds appear? Well, there's a cloud on Mount Sinai when the glory of God appeared on it and gave the Ten Commandments. There was a cloud that filled the tabernacle at the end of Exodus and the glory of the Lord filled it. There was a pillar of cloud that guided the Israelites from the Red Sea and through the wilderness. When Solomon dedicated the built temple of God, there was a cloud that filled it, so much so that the priests could not even officiate in it. Clouds mean God is here. The Father's presence is here. And this is one of three times that the voice of the Father spoke during the ministry of Christ. At his baptism, here the transfiguration... And then later during the last week before his crucifixion, there was yet again the voice that glorified the Son. He has not changed. 
And when I pray to God with my troubles, with my stresses, when I pray for humility during the victories of life, this is the Jesus through whom I am praying. And this makes the problems and the difficulties and the struggles of life shrink into their proper perspective. There's also another significance behind the transfiguration of Christ. And that is the affirmation that he, and he alone, is the official spokesman of God. You remember who Jesus appeared with in a glorified form as well? Moses and Elijah. Moses was the one who was the prophet lawgiver of God. The one that was meeker than any person on the face of the earth. One through whom God spoke and he spoke face to face like a friend. Moses was the one who said, Lord, show me your glory. And God hid him in a cleft of the rock and he passed by and proclaimed his character. This is Moses, the prophet, the lawgiver of God. The great one who gave them their inspired scriptures that were the covenant relationship they had with God. Well, who was Elijah? He was the great prophet of God. The one that was sent during the iron reign of Ahab and of Jezebel in Israel. And he was sent to try try and draw the people back to God, away from the idols of their hearts and the lands around them, to renew in them a zeal and a desire to be the sole covenant people of God, to have no other gods before them but the Lord alone. Elijah was the suffering, persecuted prophet of God. And so you think about what these two had in common. A number of things. These were two spokesmen of God. They were two prophets of God that were rejected by their countrymen. Moses was rejected even while they were in Egypt. When he killed an Egyptian and then the next day sought to be a peacemaker among his own people, one of his own countrymen rejected him and he said, Who who made you a lord over us? Are you going to kill me like the Egyptian yesterday? And throughout the wilderness at Mount Sinai, over and over, they were constantly rebelling and pushing against Moses' leadership. And certainly Elijah was so rejected by the king, by the queen, and by his own people that there came a point where he despaired. And he said, Lord, you just need to kill me. You need to kill me. No one worships you. No one cares about you anymore. I'm the only one left. The Lord gave him a reminder about that. But Elijah also was a rejected spokesman of God. And they both saw appearances or manifestations of God's glory on Mount Sinai. Moses in the aforementioned moment when he saw the character of God and Elijah when he saw the wind, the fire, and the earthquake on the mountain and then the still small whisper that assured Elijah of his task and of God's presence with him. And Jesus fits all of these. He was rejected by his own. He came into his own and his own did not receive him. He was rejected even in his hometown of Nazareth by his own family members. Jesus was rejected by his own and more importantly by his own creation made in his image. He was the prophet of God. He was rejected and he himself also now is appearing on a mountain to express his glory. There's also a third similarity that these all have in common besides being prophets being rejected they were taken from this life in unique ways. Moses' body was taken by the Lord and no one knew his burial place. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind and Jesus himself would be crucified but would rise from the dead and would ascend to be the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. Jesus, however, is the sole spokesman of God. As Peter and the others saw them, they said, let's make three shrines to these individuals. But the voice said, this, not these, this is my beloved son. They were servants. Jesus was the son and the heir. He was the one in whom the father was well pleased. And he said, listen to him. And so Jesus then became the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He embodied the law. He by his life showed what it meant to love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, might, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. And the rest of the law was summed up. And he was the fulfillment of the prophets. Those spokesmen of God who came to remind them of the covenant relationship with him. Jesus embodied them. And as John would later write. 
the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The authority of Moses and Elijah now is limited, directed by, and is subordinate to the authority of Jesus Christ. As he told all of his apostles, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. There's a third lesson then that we need to gain from the transfiguration. And that is Jesus as the victorious king. Have you ever thought, why did the transfiguration, which we read in Matthew 17 and then Mark and Luke 9, why do we read it about this point in his ministry? There's a reason why I told the story and the account in the sequence I did. Because all three of the gospel accounts that record it all give the same series of events that bookend the transfiguration. And it's an important lesson in our Bible study that when we read through the Gospels, events that have bookends of similar events or similar sayings are highlighting what's in the middle. And so when you see the transfiguration of Christ, all three accounts begin with, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be rejected, and I will be killed. I will be raised, however. We have the transfiguration, then we have the demon-possessed boy that's healed, And then we have another announcement of his death and his resurrection. These are bookending the transfiguration, highlighting it. And I think the message there is not only for the apostles, not only for the audience afterwards that would hear, but for us. And that is, the Jesus that would be rejected by the Jews is accepted by the Father. The Jesus that would be shamed and humiliated and spat upon by his own people was made radiant and bright by his father. The Jews who would not listen to him and mocked him was the one that the father said, this is my beloved son. The Jews who ridiculed Christ on the cross and said, why doesn't he come down? Why doesn't the father save him if he'll still have him? He was the one in whom the father was well pleased. The great rejection of mankind was the great acceptance of the father. And the transfiguration was God's way of affirming not just to Christ, but more so to the apostles. Whatever is about to happen, he is discharging my will and pouring out his soul into death, and I am pleased with it. This is what I want. This is our plan. And it's a reminder that the glorified Christ, by his rejection by men and acceptance by the Father was receiving true approval and glory. The stone that was rejected by men was indeed precious in the sight of God. And so the apostles then were to carry this image, this sight and this scene with them, and it would support and strengthen them in their ministry. And it was a reminder to them that if they would take up their cross, they would accept the rejection and the persecution. And if they would accept willingly being the off-scouring of the entire world and held up as a mockery before the world, if they would accept that and they would bear that burden, they also would be glorified with their Lord. And as Jesus had promised them, they could be on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It's the message that the path to God's approval is through suffering, it's through sacrifice, and it's through a love for others that overwhelms our selfishness. And redirects our entire being into service to our God. And if we will do that, he will similarly glorify us as he did his son. What a powerful moment this transfiguration was. You know, in those accounts it says that Jesus told the apostles as they were coming down from the mountain. Don't tell anyone what you've seen until after the resurrection. They didn't understand it, but they would come to understand all the significance of the transfiguration. Let's turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, let's read together verse 16.
For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power in coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. The apostles did not immediately understand the significance of this event. They did not speak of it until after the resurrection. But they lived the rest of their lives and they gave their lives telling the message with unwavering conviction. The transfiguration was the signal for them of what would be their own transfiguration. Their own transformation. Their own renewal in faith and commitment to Jesus as a resurrected Lord. And just as surely as they came down from the mountain and they, the apostles collectively, were incapable of casting out this demon. Here was a message then that by the Lord's help, by the Lord's empowerment, and if they accept the Lord's transformation of them, they will triumph over the kingdom of darkness and they will proclaim a message that will transfer people from the power of darkness, from the power of Satan, until God. So that they can receive the forgiveness of sins and entrance into his heavenly kingdom. Ruled by the transfigured Lord. And I also think then, not only if Peter and what he later wrote about this event. John doesn't write specifically of this event. But what is interesting to me and what moves me personally is that God gave John almost as if a second picture of what the transfiguration. John received a deafening echo of the transfiguration when we look together over in Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1, John says, I saw and heard the voice that was as loud as a trumpet behind me. And we read in Revelation 1 verse 12, John writes, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And if we pause there, Jesus now does something for John that he did on the mountain of transfiguration. As glorified as he was, as exalted a king as he was, clothed in eternal majesty, he reached out and he touched his beloved apostle. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first And the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. You know, you're probably like me in this respect. I'm afraid of dying. I I, I am afraid of death. And not in the sense of I don't have confidence or comfort about being a Christian and facing death. I don't mean that. And uh, as flawed and as a sinful, unworthy man that I am, and we all can say this, I have confidence and I have faith in the grace and the forgiveness of the Lord. So in that sense, I'm not afraid of death. But I am afraid. I face death and I think about it with trepidation. Even standing here now, I feel like there are things I need to do and I'm afraid of dying. 
but death doesn't control me. The transfiguration controls me. That is what moves me. That is what supports me. And even though, yes, I may be afraid of death, I am much more eager about and interested in life and the life that Jesus has in store for us. And it reminds me as well, the transfiguration does, that if I will accept the path of death, first of self, and then if I will look at death, not as a conqueror of me, but as a defeated foe, that yes, I've got to face, but I'm not facing that defeated foe alone. If I will embrace that, I've embraced the message of the transfiguration of Christ. And then he will change me. Someday. And I will meet him in the clouds with others. And we will forever be with our Lord. And when we see him and we're with him and we're in his presence... We're not seeing the one so much that was nailed to the cross, but the exalted, glorified I am, who was dead, but lives forevermore. And on that day, I suppose that the key to death and Hades will be thrown away, because it won't be needed anymore, because death and Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire, and it will be no more, and there will only be life with our Lord. And what I'm asking you to do this morning is to set aside and stop everything in your life so that you can make things right with God. And when that day comes, you can view, you view not just the transfigured Lord, but the eternal Lord in all of his glory for all time. And if there's anything that we can do this morning to assist you in making your life right with the Lord, if you will come to him in full faith and in commitment and in willingness to die and be raised yourself spiritually, we'll hear your confession this morning and we'll baptize you. And you will be transfigured. Or if it's the case that we can be of encouragement, a blessing to you in any kind of way, we wish you'd make that known. In any case, we ask that you'll accept the Lord's invitation while we stand and while we sing together.